on our thoughts of education platform we have dr richa govil director school of development so she uh, richa govil ma'am is working with the uh, azim premji university and she uh, took a time out of the, of her busy schedule to give uh, to have a brief interaction with us so so ma'am uh, i will start with uh, with the interview so beginning with the first and the foremost question uh, like everybody of us has is azim premji university is focus on education for change could you please shed some light on the motive of education of change education for social change and how the azim premji university is planning to work on it sure sure so when we say uh, education for social change uh, right it's important to understand what we mean by that so um you know our society today our country today the world today uh, is faced with uh, many many big challenges some of these are social in nature so for example uh, economic and social inequalities um some of them are um, economic in nature some of them are environmental in nature and so on and it's um these are very complex issues and to be able to really address them uh, requires a very good quality education uh, where students not only understand the um the conceptually uh, what is causing some of these challenges but also have gained some practical skills so that they are able to contribute uh, towards uh, changing some of these for the better so when we say education for social change that is what we are trying to do we have a very clear social purpose to contribute to a more equitable just humane and sustainable society and we hope um that is what our students are able to do over their careers and uh, the majority of our students do do that uh, they when they graduate they work for organizations um who are uh, working towards addressing some of these very very complex challenges okay uh so ma'am coming towards our second question so uh, being the director of school of development at azim premji university what's your philosophy of leadership and how you describe your leadership style um i was uh, you know uh thrown into a, a position of leadership when i was about 20 um and over a period of few years we uh, ended up developing um a large uh, organization in the social sector with uh, over 500 people and uh this was in the us so with a fundraising budget of you know um over a million us dollars and through this experience and even the experiences since then that i've had in leadership in the corporate world in academia and other places i i think leadership is about um more than anything about nurturing um you know to have a very clear idea of the uh, direction in which we would like to go um and over a period of time be able to get to that and you know we have people with very many different um backgrounds uh, motivations abilities uh, that one must work with and how do you bring alignment uh, among this large group of people uh, towards a common purpose and this is the kind of uh, thing that requires a lot of work um whether it's through small everyday actions or you know occasional large decisions and trade offs that one makes as part of uh, any uh, any group effort so i would say um yeah i'm um, basically it's mostly about nurturing and having a clear idea of uh, the direction as well as bringing in alignment uh, to work towards those um and in these kinds of you know current times where it's challenging for most people but even otherwise it also involves a lot of uh, work in supporting people um because we do know that we all face different kinds of uh, challenges at different times and it's important to be able to do that also okay so ma'am coming towards our third question uh like uh, i just want to know like how you strategize about the key programs and plans for the marketing and administration of your school okay so see I, as i said our university has a very clear social purpose and everything must align to that so um if if you look at our current programs the the um, all the programs that we offer whether at the undergraduate level or the graduate level or the future programs that we are planning they must prepare young people 
to be able to bring about social change in an effective manner. Um, <clears throat> this requires, uh, you know, uh, some strategic decisions in terms of which programs we offer and invest in, um, and some that we will not. And it uh, also um, requires us to be very careful about what do we teach and how do we teach it. Um, because a lot of time, I mean, these are very huge spaces. You know, if you take something like, uh, I gave you the example of um, uh, uh, different kinds of social challenges, but for example, in our master's in development program, right, we have to be very careful about, it's a huge, huge space. So we have to be very careful about what we bring in and what is something that the students can learn on their own. Um, also, I think it's important uh, to be, uh, you know, to, to make sure that that program continues to be very rigorous um, and of a high quality. Um, and this takes a, you know, a lot of work over a period of time, you know, improvements as we keep going and learning ourselves. Um, so it's just a journey. And, uh, you know, I think one thing I'd like to say, you know, you've talked about uh, the marketing of programs. See, um, in our kind of a space, our uh, alumni are the best uh, method of marketing. Um, you know, just in, I'll talk about just one program, but this is true across all the programs. You know, we have um, more than a thousand people, alumni, um, uh, just from the Masters in Development program who are working in many, many different parts of the country in very difficult situations, working with marginalized communities. You know, they're starting new initiatives. They're working with existing NGOs. Um, they are sometimes, um, working uh, as part of government efforts, uh, advocacy groups. Um, sometimes they are joining uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, elected positions as well or hope to join. So it's different kinds of um, work that they are doing. And I think there can be no better marketing for our kind of program than the solid work that our alumni are doing across the country. Yeah, very true, ma'am. So ma'am, uh, coming towards our next question is about the curriculum of Azim Premji University, like uh, how the curriculum ensured the best practice of industry? Um, see, for us, industry, again, is the world of social change, right? So what does that mean? That means uh, NGOs, that means social movements, collectives, uh, advocacy groups, other kinds of um, even unregistered and informal groups that exist in the country who are working in uh, rural areas, let's say with small farmers, or they may be working with migrants, they may be working in urban areas, uh, with, uh, with communities with uh, you know, difficult socioeconomic circumstances, they may be working on violence against women, they may be working on this whole slew of of challenges that we face as a society and even future or emergent challenges like climate change. Um, so when we think of industry, this is our industry. And um, therefore, for our students, it's very important that they learn not only from um, you know, theories and the history, uh, uh, ideas from you know, history as well, but also they are familiar with the current ground realities. What is actually happening in these spaces, um, in, um, in villages, in cities, within India, outside India, they have to have a very strong understanding of the ground realities. And because these are people who are going to work to bring about social change, they must have the capability to do that. So they also must learn um, from practice, as we call it, right? The practice of development practice of education, um, practice of policy and governance, regardless of whichever program they are part of. Um, and these are things that are absolutely critical. Um, so when we think about uh, what makes for a good program, um, these are the kinds of, uh, you know, of considerations that we have. Okay. Uh, so ma'am, uh, now the question arises like, uh, how welcoming Azim Premji universities to students of different races or economic backgrounds coming from all over India? Um, see, um, for, for us, this is part of who we are. Um, you know, we look at uh, diversity uh, of the student body 
and more important than diversity i would say inclusiveness of the student body in in multiple ways so for example uh, roughly 50% of our students um, are female 50% are male we also uh, look at um, where they're coming from so roughly half our students are actually from small towns um and uh, even uh, villages uh, and roughly half the students are from let's say state capitals and metros right so there's a huge diversity that we have in our student body we look at where and in what language students have done their um let's say completed their 10th uh, standard and that also gives us a very good sense of the true diversity of the student body so we look at many many different kinds of um of parameters and so we can say you know with confidence that we really do have a, a very uh, good inclusion of people from various uh, backgrounds um uh, you know in terms of socio economic um, and other characteristics okay uh so ma'am uh, now the next question is like uh there is a lot of uh, information about azim prem university already available on uh, google and but what do you think is one of the information or like uh, something about your uh, university which is pe which people may not know and you see as a biggest strength for your university um i can mention a few things um so for example um let's just take um you know something i mentioned earlier about uh, being a you know a high quality uh, a very rigorous program now what does that actually mean right that means that at a university you know students have a quite a lot of material that they have to read our classroom and, and be able to engage in classroom discussions now one of the things that um unfortunately very very few colleges and universities in india do is to um create a learning environment which is not a one way environment um that is you know the professor um teaches and the student you know learns and occasionally they may have doubts our classrooms are very different than from that you know we have a lot of lively discussions and debates uh that take place as part of our classrooms we have um many um very uh, repu reputed uh, people who are heads of uh, organizations who we invite uh, to do guest lectures or guest interactions in our classrooms uh, we hold supplementary workshops on certain topics you know it can range from a wide of things so for example we have supplementary workshops on understanding development finance or right to education how to uh, sorry right to information and how to uh, file file an rti we've had uh, workshops on uh, let's say weavers and and their realities so it's a it's a huge uh, you know there is a huge effort made to make sure that learning is um practical uh, and um it's deeper than um, you know than how um, often it is seen as so it's it's not simply about Uh, taking a particular text, uh, text or you know what is known like you kind of get in a text with kind of knowledge but it's actually understanding um thinking about things critically um to really understand what is going on who's saying what why are they saying something or doing something and then also to be able to act upon it so i think that would be one of the um um biggest things that would be important for um us uh, students uh, who are considering joining us to know i would also add a few other things you know um yes ma'am as part of this creation of this kind of a learning environment we also um aim for a different kind of faculty student interaction right so our faculty uh, many of our alumni uh you know when you ask them about the learning environment they talk about the faculty members um across all the programs uh whether it's undergraduate or graduate program so one of our biggest strengths is that our faculty members are approachable um we are also available to students um for um clarifications for even mentoring you know many of our students are in touch with us for career advice even after they graduate or something they are working on they reach out to us so it's a kind of um educational space 
uh, which allows students to really flourish. Um, and we have in, uh, invested quite a bit in that. And uh, lastly, I will say that because it is meant to be this kind of a very intense um, learning experience, students do require support. Um, you know, we take in students from a large variety of educational backgrounds and it does take them sometimes a little bit more extra effort or time to, to familiarize with them, with them so how, how do you function at this kind of a university. And so for that we provide all kinds of support, sometimes it's language support, so I was telling you that you know many of our students come from smaller towns and um, rural areas. And um, sometimes they need language support, sometimes they need, need other kinds of support. We provide mentoring, um, both um, uh, you know, by the faculty as well as other forms. So as much as possible, we, you know, once we admit a student, our effort is uh, whatever support they need to do well here, uh, we try to provide that to the extent possible. Of course, uh, there's a big role uh, that the students themselves have to yes. play uh, yeah. in doing the work but uh, we do try to help them with that. That's something very positive about Azim Dreams University. Ma so now I'm coming towards our next question. So uh, what do you see as a top priority of Azim Dreams University over the next 10 years? Okay. Um, see, uh, we, are, uh, we are a growing university. Um, and the, the priority for us is to grow in the directions that support our overall purpose. So, um, which is, um, as I said earlier, to contribute to the, excuse me, um, to social change. And to be able to do that, we have to, uh, we are uh, um, launching new programs. Um, so some, uh, some of the programs that we are currently considering are PG diploma programs, we are considering uh, offering new master's programs um, and all of these would um, uh, align to the overall purpose of the university. Just this year, for example, in our undergraduate programs, we have started um, offering uh, majors in uh, subjects that we were not offering last year. So, for example, we've added philosophy, history um, and so on. We are also in about a month or two planning to um, introduce a PG diploma in development leadership. Um, so you can, uh, you know, for a young university, um, our uh, current focus is really going to be to, uh, to be uh, able to grow the number of programs and the, the students in our program. So currently we have over uh, 1,400 students um, enrolled at the university and that is also something that we are planning to grow over a period of time. Okay. So ma'am, coming towards our next question. So what, what are some biggest challenges you see both for the higher education in general and for the Azim Premji University specifically? Um, I think for um, uh, higher education in general, let's take that one first. Um, I, I think, you know, what we see uh, is often a large numbers of students who have come through years and years of schooling. They have come through, you know, years of undergraduate, their bachelor's education, uh, but they have not really been encouraged to think for themselves. Uh, they have not really been encouraged to, you know, engage in critical thinking. Because, um, I mean, that's just the nature of our education system, you know, where there is, uh, the teacher provides or the textbook provides one correct answer, and that's just supposed to be the answer. So I think one of the biggest challenges for um, the higher education system and even the in the schooling is to be able to encourage students to uh, think critically, think independently, and be able to arrive at what they think um, you know are the answers you know at least in in the subject uh, sense, but also uh, more broadly. I think you know in modern world this is an I mean, not just in modern world, but especially today with what is happening, the kinds of debates that take place, the kinds of fake news, all kinds of things that surround us. This is an absolutely critical life skill. And uh, we hope that um, this is something that uh, gets more attention. Very true, ma'am. Uh, so, ma'am, coming towards our uh, next question. 
so uh, is there any suggestion from your end you would like to give to current youth and aspiring students um i i think um, you know one is what i just said you know uh, to be able to examine the world around them and understand it um and not just very simplistically you know often we have this these two sides of a debate and all, both of them oversimplify the issues at stake you know you can take any issue uh, and right now we're doing this um discussion at the time of covid and uh, you know even about whether there should be should have been a lockdown not lockdown open schools not open schools anything we look at if they, these issues are made to be too simplistic um and but we know i mean we know real life is not like that so uh, one of the most important things i would say is first to be able to understand the real issue um and not just oversimplify it into you know easy slogans um and this also connects to my previous point about critical thinking which is that to be able to do that you have to be able to understand what the issues are and then be able to analyze them and then form your own judgment and this takes time and effort it takes a lot of reading and um i mean the internet has become our go to place for information but even in the internet there are unreliable sources there are reliable sources there are all kinds of things and you know in the current world we have to be able to develop a judgment about what is reliable what is reputable and what is not and i think this is really the one area where um the uh, whether uh, you know the young people of the country really have to figure out how to deal with this world where you don't really sometimes even know what the facts are um and this requires investment of time uh these are not things that will come simply and these are not things that will come out of textbooks that's something uh like even i know started to feel like to think on it so this is something to think think upon so ma'am coming yes, towards yes. our last our last question like how you tend to establish a healthy relation and environment in your institute right um so some of this i had uh, commented on earlier but I'll, i'll say that again which is you know first and foremost we um we demand a very high quality of work um from uh, from students uh yet at the same time we we do provide uh to the extent possible uh, different kinds of support so it can be um um financial support it can be counseling services it can be mentoring so all faculty members for example at the university across all programs uh we have a certain number of student mentees uh who you know we work with from the day they join and over a period of time they learn how to cope they learn how to function and um some of them maintain those relationships some of them move on and uh, it's you know uh but it's very nice to see that you know somebody develop over a period of time so we try to create these kinds of positive and supportive um you know relationships and environment at the university so that the um you know we, because we do understand that you know these are um uh you know there's usually a lot of pressure in an education system and um and we all see different kinds of news stories about the extreme difficulties that uh, you know some students face so what we want to achieve is that we do demand work um but at the same time we also um, support the students um in this uh, effort in you know whatever uh, ways um, are suitable for for different students so ma'am thank you for uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule and in interacting with college union it was a uh, insightful session and glad to have an interaction with you thank you once again ma'am thank you very thank much you. thank you ma'am